It has been quite a while since we have done our last Path to War podcast interview, but this one is not going to disappoint. This episode has been in the works for quite a while. There's a lot of really cool information that's going to be talked about in this episode. I'm really excited to share this with you. Let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and jump right into the video. Welcome back. I hope you were super excited for this next Path to War podcast episode. I'm super thrilled to be able to bring this to you. As always, though, before we get going, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more Path to War podcast interviews, make sure you like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you were not already so you don't miss any future uploads. Let's try to get this video to at least 150 likes. And there's a lot of really cool information and detail and the story behind this episode. So feel free to share this video with anybody that you know that might be interested in taking a look at this. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. What is up, guys? We are back with the third installment of the Path to War podcast interview style series. Today, we have got TQ5, one of the strongest players in Warpath here with us. He is currently in server 34. He is going to give us a more in-depth introduction about himself and his kind of Warpath history, but he's also got a really interesting uh, discussion that we're going to have here, which is in regard to his recent trip to the Lilith HQ in Shanghai. He's going to talk about what ended up leading to him going there anyway, his experience while he was there, and then also some things regarding the game that he was able to discuss with the Warpath team directly. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can give us a more formal introduction about yourself. Hi, I'm Thomas Rogers. I play TQ5 Fun on Warpath. Um, my background, similar to the second one you guys did, Willie, I'm a prior military. I went into the service to get money to go to college. Um, I, uh, I, I'm retired. I've been retired for 12 years. I bought and sold companies for a living. Um, and I've been retired since 2012 and I played games before I played game of war, um, back when it got started, um, uh, here in the U S and I bounced between games until I found this one. And I started slow cause I wasn't sure how it was going to go. And I got addicted to it. And here I am. I'm one of the players that are in the top 10, easy top 10. And uh, I started in server 30. Uh, I played in silver until I got shamed out by the players saying I was too big. <laughs> and so then I moved uh, to a, a, an alliance called OTL for a short period. That alliance fell apart pretty quick. And then from there, I went to AVE. I was there four months in AVE. And, uh, and now, uh, from there I came here. Um, I was going to go to your past server. Uh, what server was, 24. Yeah. I was yep. going to go to server 24. I was in talks with some guys from there, but then, uh, I guess word around the campfire got out and the guys from the U S 14 had the most U S players I'd ever seen. And they invited me in to a voice chat, uh, a video chat. And I just was like, wow, I didn't know there were so many players. And they were a cool bunch. And so I decided to go that direction. And so it was in the first Paramount Cup when that happened. I think you remember uh, how that went. And so it uh, once I got and I had not been in a group in a voice chat much like that. I met one or two players, but not. Hell, there was 20 players. There were some still play, playing the game. Some were moving, fighting, talking. It was really neat how it was It was super interesting. And so I, um, Dr. X was a really neat guy. He, uh, he was in there. And so they, they convinced me that that's where I needed to go. And so I've been there ever since. And now we migrated after uh, there was, I'm trying to remember when the alliance fell apart, but you know, these glory server things really kill an alliance. And so we moved to try to um, fix that problem. And it, it didn't, <laughs> it failed. We, uh, we ran out of spots and we went glory pretty quick. And so I'm, I think at the 
first first night it took about two hours to get people moved over it wasn't the secret wasn't kept very well and so people moved and it went glory before we even had half the team moved and so it, it really threw a wrench in the system it was kind of a neat roller coaster ride at the time but it uh it ended up uh it ended up okay i guess we all ended up in the right place some people ended up in another server because they you know if you don't if you're not actually careful you can end up in a different server than the one you're going to. <laughs> there, were, there were a few players. I did hear about that. Wrong, I did hear about they that. They ended up in the wrong server. So it was really funny because uh, we got laughing at them because it took a whole month to get them back to the server. And so, uh, and then and then we didn't know if we were going to, because we left a bunch of uh, Paramount points at 14, and we didn't know if we were going to be able to get enough points to come. But uh, I meant because 40 didn't come we were able to slide into the slot because 40 would have had more points than we did um the old mass had more points than we did so because none of those uh servers went we slipped in there at the at the at the last second and got a spot yeah the uh the current paramount cup is definitely an interesting uh dynamic right now uh, in regards to there only being five teams especially with you competing in the first paramount cup like myself i am not currently competing in the second paramount cup which we're going to discuss some of that uh here later on but yeah that's um i think it was a kind of a shock to a lot of the community that there was only five teams that went obviously there was more that qualified than that but there i mean the fact that teams some very strong teams and servers were dodging uh the paramount cup which i can't i'm pretty impartial to that at, at least right now because i understand both sides of that conversation um but it sounds like based on your trip to uh talk and visit with the team at lilith that is going to be something that uh, they are going to work on addressing as well. So they are. we're going to get into we're going to get into that. So thank you very much for the introduction about you personally. Um, I was very much looking forward to doing this once you reached out to me a few weeks ago and told me about your trip to Lilith. Uh, and for those of you that uh, don't know, uh, because obviously I keep a lot of my conversations private with different players. I've got players reaching out to me, uh, you know, from all over the community. TQ5 and I have. Uh, pretty much had you know somewhat of an open dialogue since really the beginning of the first paramount cup and we've maintained uh that relationship uh since then so it's uh he's kept me up to speed on what he's been doing in regard to this trip um and now i do want to go ahead and, and pivot and start getting into this lilith trip and kind of everything that was discussed so tell us what caused you or what was the factor in you going to visit the lilith hq in the first place Okay, so um, my son is a competitive skydiver inside and out. He competes in the sky and indoor. They make these machines that wind tunnels that you can go fly in all over the world. And Shanghai, or, uh, China won the bid for this year's uh, World Cup of Indoor Skydiving, and it was in Macau. There's a brand new tunnel there, and that's where the that was the host. And so because we were going to this competition and typically we go and for two weeks, we go a week ahead, they train in the tunnel. And then the week of the competition, uh, there's lots of events and stuff going on uh, during that that you can spectate for and compete in. And so what I did was I was like, I looked on the map and Shanghai was really close and there were other people talking about going and they ended up for one reason or another, not going, but I stuck to it because I was so close. It's only a two hour flight from Macau to Shanghai. Um, and it, it was a little bit of a rocky road to do it because I didn't realize that after COVID Ch China's closed, you don't get travel visas very easily there. Um, and that's still the case like now. Yeah, still the case. It's but what they do have, they have a what a, a, a way of doing it as long as you're willing to uh, abide by these rules. So, what what China has done is for Shanghai, it's a 144 hour transit visa, which was plenty of time for me to visit and then come back to Macau. But a transit visa means you come from one place, you come to Shanghai, and then you have to leave and go to another place. 
Well, for me, it wasn't too hard because Macau is, has an airport. So I flew from Macau to Shanghai. Um, and then from Shanghai, I came back to Hong Kong, which Hong Kong, you, there's shuttles that you can take a bus and go across that 24 mile bridge over to the island of Macau. And so I did that. And that's considered a true transit. And so I, I was able to get the visa to do it that way. And uh, I let them know at Lilith there. I have a contact person. She's in the picture, by the way, that you have. She's a Carnegie Mellon graduate, smart as she can be. And she took care of me the entire way. She got me set up on the pay app so I could travel while I was there. Because in Shanghai, there's no cash. It's a cashless city. Um, and so you have to have this app. And it's called Alipay. And uh, so she got me set up on that. She picked me up at the airport. Um, we traveled back to the hotel that I was staying at. And when you come from somewhere else, it has to be an approved hotel. You, it's not like in America where you can just show up and check in. Um, in China, it has to be an approved hotel for international travelers. And so uh, they found the hotel for me for that. I, I was able to stay. It wasn't very far from the Lilith headquarters. So I stayed there. The next morning I got up and um, – uh, it was Sunday, so I got to travel and visit. Uh, I visited the city down where the the Pearl is. It's a big building. It's a tourist area. So I was able to see that. And then Monday morning was uh, my visit into Lilith. And um, so she picked me up at the at the hotel. We, we took the, a ride into the headquarters early, and everybody was traveling in for work. So it was neat to see all the people. And... Uh, Shanghai is an interesting city. It's not like New York where it's concrete and skyscrapers. There is plants and trees everywhere. It doesn't look like a city. It feels like an urban area, even though it's the most populated city in the world. And so we went to this big building. We went to the floors. There's multiple floors of Lilith headquarters that, you know, Lilith doesn't just run one game, but this game has multiple floors. And so we went in. I got through security there. And then we went up and we had a team meeting with all the developers, which you see in that picture. And I will and, pull that picture up for you guys while he is talking, because it's a pretty cool picture. It's him, and uh, it looks like a pretty sizable part of uh, the Lilith team. So you guys can see that on screen now. So here is TQ5, and here are some of uh, the members of the Lilith team he is um, actually talking about. Yeah, so, so the person that, that was what I call my handler, that she's answered questions, actually, uh, she's my point of contact if I need anything from Lilith now. She is the, the, the girl with the pink shirt on to, the, to my, it's to the left of me. I'm in the center under the eye. And so, but the, the person in charge of Warpath, the, the chief developer, he is the person on my right. And the uh, gentleman that's to my to the left of you, uh, uh, as you're looking at the picture to the left of me, he's in charge of the Paramount Cup that we were just talking about. He is the one that keeps that running well and is in charge of that. He's these are all department heads of Lilith. They are um, they they are very conservative. They're well spoken. They're the smartest people in the room. Um, and they, they want to make the game better. And they asked, they asked two or three hours of questions and, and, oh, wow. and, and answered questions about the game, uh, to make it better. They, they wanted to, they had a plethora of questions to ask, which we're going to get into. One of the big ones, uh, that they wanted that we're really concerned about is alliance size because they think as well as a lot of players that have made feedback um, that alliance size is something that needs to drop because it's just too big. And that's the reason the Paramount Cup is five player, five teams instead of eight. And I, I believe that that would fix it because if you take the five teams right now that are 255 players strong each team and divided it down to, let's, let's pick a random number like 100. Well, that's 20 new teams now instead of five. Or if you went 150, it would be less, you know, obviously, depending on what numbers you pick. I don't know what the happy medium is, but they are considering it. And what they're going to do, they're going to methodically go through it and decide what to do. They're going to put out a survey after the Paramount Cup, and they're going to ask everyone about it. And based on that feedback, they are going to come up with a plan, and they are going to implement it. 
and hopefully i think it's going to be for the best i don't know what the community thinks but um i believe it's going to make more competition better competition and a lot more factions are going to develop from it sure and that's what you want you you really want it because you don't want it the way that it was because now realistically with s21 the way it is they're the dominant team and it if they hadn't have made the setup the way that they did in the game, it would have been much worse. So they, I don't know if you noticed how they, they put 21 in the farthest place from everyone else. So it was much harder for them. And now they still made quick work of the bottom half of the map, but everyone else was in opposite areas from them. And it did make the first week was strong. It was a fun, we fought FWZ the first week and had a really good time at it. Now AVE has come over to help and S 21 has moved around there. And so it seems as though, uh, the fighting is mixed. It depends on what people are doing. If there's a fight going on near us, that's where everybody comes. If there's a fight at the, a fort, that's where everybody goes. So it's been kind of moving around, but it's, it's been a pretty good time so far. So I've, I've, kind of enjoyed it um i have gotten tons and tons of kills in this event and if you look at it it's kind of lopsided at this point because i focused on this event strong i've been 18 20 sometimes all day hours on this this event and it shows in fight machine i think i'm 80 million points ahead of the next player in fight machine so uh, i'm up there i don't know if i can hold out this long and keep up the pace sure because it, it's tough but, well so uh, so i want to i want to kind of talk about this whole alliance size a little bit more uh, for just yeah. a couple of minutes here so that is something the reduction in total number of alliance members is something that when i have done videos discussing the game and some of the you know balancing issues and these conquest events uh you know at the epic level for uh starters and then obviously at least in my personal view, everything's got a, a trickle down effect or a snowball effect. What you know, if you will, if we can fix the problem at the top, that's going to have a positive impact, in my opinion, on all of the lower, um, you know, tiered battlefields. You know, your golds, and then uh, you know, at the bottom, your silvers there, which is good for all different players uh, within the game. You're really competitive players that are. Um, you know, just really competitive, but may not spend a lot. And then players like yourself that play a lot and also spend a lot. Um, you know, I think if we can find that balance at the higher level, it would make the game a lot more enjoyable and sustainable for players in those, you know, more casual battlefields. Uh, with that being said, I've seen when I've covered these topics in past videos, and I've also had discussions with different players about it on live streams as well, the suggestion that i was that i've seen a lot is this reduction in total number of players per alliance and i was pretty uh anti that for for a long time because warpath has always been i played the game for over three years now and it's always been 255 players that's just what it's always been um and i've started to really warm up to that idea because i do think that would help spread the talent out um and spread the power out and it would make things more competitive i think and i would love to get your thoughts on this a couple of because there's not there's not a perfect solution right there's some solutions or no. ideas that might be better than others but there's always going to be um you know problems with anything but the goal i think is to have a solution that is the best it possibly can be for the most amount of players in the game and so some of the kind of counter arguments to the player reduction size is, well, uh, you know, this is some things that players have, have mentioned. And I would, like I said, love to get your thoughts on this is they're like, okay, well you can reduce the number of players per alliance, but that's not going to reduce, uh, well still flooding into one server and one team. So you might have less players, but you might now have, let's just use the example you said with like a hundred players. Uh, and I know rise of kingdoms, uh, which I have recently got into, is uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's either 100. Or, I'm sorry, it's either 150 or 155 is the max capacity for an alliance. And if you reduce it like that, and let's just use your example of 100 players, you're still going to have potentially 100 mega whales, you know, flooding into one team together. And then now you might have 
you know, other team. You might have more teams in the game for sure, but how do you combat that from happening where almost these super alliances are being formed? What, what, what's well, your thought on that? Uh, my thought is, is that if let's, let's stay with the hundred cause I, it's an easier number to do the math in your head. So imagine this, um, you, you drop it down to a hundred, all of a sudden there are hundreds more teams because if you look at the, the numbers of players, there are thousands of players and a lot of them are in gold and there's some silvers and, uh, and the, the tears and, um, Imagine if there were 40 teams that had that were all active, they played a lot, and they're all competing for the cup. And they, they, they fight, you get the numbers, the points come along, they have all these level fours, and then you end up with the very tippy best of those, the eight top teams. Well, you have no idea if your team's going to make it or not. And with 100 players... It's remember when uh, in the first Paramount Cup you had 21 and hashtag 21, they were teamed up. Well, that may not be the way it happens because if hashtag 21 doesn't make the points that say the server 40 teams do, they're not going to make it into the cup. And so, how do you make an alliance with a team that you've never even fought in a level four because you're not even in that same uh, region to fight? And so you'll be facing new teams. Now, yes, obviously in the level fours, they're going to mix it around, mix it around, and and you w may get exposed to it, but you may not get exposed to it with your companion alliance. Because at the beginning, when they break these alliances apart, there will be some companionship alliances that say, hey, we can make two strong alliances, and then we'll rule it. Well, that may be true, but if, if one of those alliances gets edged out of the top eight, and they don't make it. Well, now what? Now you don't have mem now you don't have uh, uh, agreements, and you you can't play together. And so it will put a new dynamic in it that will make it a little easier to get to where you want to be, and it makes it a much better fight. I believe you. Um, you we've seen it. I mean, you don't want to be playing against teams that dominate it because then there's no fight everybody just stays in the safe zone collects the free stuff and moves on to the next one uh you don't want that you want everybody fighting for the middle you want to be able to see eight strong teams battling out and pushing towards the middle and making it there unlike what we have now even with five teams uh s21 controls half the map already and the, it's not been going on long they are, they are pushed up to the entire half of the map at the bottom, and they're pushing around further. And I, I have a feeling by the time the blockhouse opens, they'll have two-thirds of the entire map blocked off from everyone else. And it's, it's just the way it is because it's such a big team. Sure, sure. So and, and You can't blame. It's human nature. I mean, everybody wants to be on the winning team. Sure. Um, and so that's where people have migrated. And... I don't know what the perfect solution is, but it's, you know, reducing the size is probably not a bad start. And then this, this throttling of how many people can move per month helps a little bit, but it's not going to be the long-term fix because even if you allow two players per month in a year's time, you can have 12 big players that have moved to Alliance. So it, it can be, or 24 big players. So that would be, uh, what? 25% of an entire alliance move in one year. So you can get those migrations that will still long-term take effect. So I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, maybe, maybe everybody go back to the server that they were born in, but I mean, that could throw chaos in the entire game and cause a mass exodus of the game. Cause you know, in game of war, that's why it died game of war was just like this it was fun people played it people spent money on it 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 didn't cost as much as this game it was way less expensive in the grand scheme of things because it was the first one of these style games to come out but it died because what they did was they devalued the currency so people that have been in the game imagine if you're you've been in this game for three years now i've been in it two two and a half um uh you picked up on the game much faster than i did i played really slow at the beginning. I've spent most of my 
game playing in silver. And then boom, I grew really fast and ended up where I am. But imagine if a new player today just joined and in a month's time could be twice as big as you because now the packs offer more stuff to grow faster. Um, it wouldn't be fun anymore. All of a sudden the game would start to die because it'd be like, well, why would I continue to play when someone new can come in and be where I'm at in a month? Right, right. So yeah. now I want to branch off of that um, and, and touch on that because I've got a question on something you said. And just to be clear uh, for the people watching, when he's talking about the S21 and then the um, like hashtag 21 team, that was actually uh, what happened the uh, first event after the first Paramount Cup. So the first Paramount Cup, it, there was it was an even split 4v4. Uh, on one side, you had server 12, server 24, uh, server 21, server 24, ser and then server 27. And then on the other side, you had uh, server 14, uh, server 19, server 30. And then who was the other team on y'all's side in that first Paramount Cup? It, mass, Mass. So we uh, was there two server? Uh, no, it was server 21. That's it. So it's server 14, yep. server 19, server 22, and server 30. And then what he's talking yeah. about in regards to the two uh, server 21 teams it started to kind of you know uh you know buddy up together that was after there was a huge influx of players migrating from all of our servers into server 21 uh right after the first paramount cup had ended the question i want to ask you and not necessarily looking for a, a specific answer here but you're in regards to the reducing the total alliance size again i've definitely started to warm up to that idea and that suggestion but let me ask you this do you think for example like a team like server 21 that's just got just more raw power than pretty much everybody else in the board right now if every single one of these teams goes from 255 down to 100 members let's say but then you take the top 100 of all of these teams in the current paramount cup for example do you think the same outcome still takes place because you've got so much uh, power, you know, concentrated into one team. It, it may be that way, but imagine this, imagine if S 21 put together their strongest team and, and it, it's a hundred players, but the other seven don't want to let them push. Well, if you had 700 players pushing on a hundred players, I don't care if they're all maxed out you're not going to get anywhere. It's numbers. This game is about team play. It's, it's not, uh, you can play solo, but if you want to get to the end results that these level fours and cups are set up to be, you got to play as a team. Sure. It, sure. It's a team game. Sure. Agreed. And I think, I think that's where, you know, the devs have their work cut out for them because agreed. And I 100% I get what you're saying, but the problem is, is now that's kind of branching into, um, you know, a diplomacy conversation if all it is. seven it remaining is. It's teams come to that too. Right. And so I guess that would be the next question, not necessarily for you just as a player base. I think that's the next question players might start asking at that point is, okay, well, we've reduced the alliance size, but does that really solve the core issue of having mega whales and a bunch of them flood into just one single server or one single team? Because now, sure, the other seven out of the eight teams, for example, could gang up on them and stop them. But then now, does that fix the overall, you know, kind of underarching problem here with the game? Or does that still continue to be an unfun experience? Because now it's seven on one, and then, you know, we beat the shit out of the one team. And then now what do we do? We're all kind of hanging out, holding hands now, right? So, I mean, maybe there's a world where there's they put not only a reduction in total total number of alliance members on teams, but I've seen people suggest things like if you've got two teams in one server, they are under no circumstances able to be paired together. Um, in any conquest event, even for example, the Paramount Cup, even if they qualify, only one team from each server is eligible to go. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of things like that that I think would fix it. And, sure, and and cause it to change uh, that that dynamic because you don't want one team dominating the whole time because either people want to be on that team or people then don't want to play at all because they are, there's no chance of getting to the top. And so you want to you want a balanced competition to where it's you know it'd be neat to see someone else win uh, occasionally other than the 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 one team but I meant you know it's it's the way it is right now and so I meant I think 
it, it was a mistake for 40 and uh and there was a couple other alliances um that could have come to the cup because i people i think people underestimate just the uh importance of these buffs that you get from skin sets and unit skins that are given out only in this event and as you grow that you know in that new section there there are some pretty significant buffs when you like when you get to that when you get to level 80 in that collector's part of uh the of the the it happened in the upgrade that collector section where you got all the the chat bubbles and skin sets and there's some pretty good buffs in that to get to the end and i think there's a race uh, I'm. I think I'm seventh now in line, moving up. And you, if you miss this event, you miss out on those options to get those points to move up. And level eighty with those ten percent training buffs that are there are going to be pretty big for the person that gets them. It's it's kind of like that skin in the first Paramount Cup. Only one player got it. That buff, no one else can get it. Those are key to have. If you want to be a strong player in the game, those those buffs, because they can't be gotten any other way. But do you think those and this is something that I know was a big topic of conversation, you know, kind of going into the first Paramount Cup. And truthfully, I agreed with it. Right. Uh, If you are in one of those top eight teams, you've obviously you and all of the members of your team, uh, at least theoretically speaking, would have had to put in a lot of time, a lot of money, and you would have had to compete in multiple events leading up to the actual Paramount Cup to make sure you qualify for the points race. So I think that's partly, I understand what you're saying, but I think that's partly maybe what turns some players off of actually going to the Paramount Cup is they're like, well, shit, you know, uh, I'm putting in all this time. I'm putting in some money to help my team get to where we need to be. And you're telling me that only one person gets this skin permanently? That one skin, yes, but there's other skins that you get in the events along the way. So everybody gets skins that are, unique to the alliances that are in the cup because we've already gotten one already in the cup that everyone got as long as you did the event we got that we got uh there was a a new uh unit skin um that was gotten in this event are these Um, are these permanent or are these temporary for everybody uh permanent if you if you get to the top there uh there and there the one in that uh, uh what was it the the yeah, I wish I could pull it up on the screen. Uh, everyone got it that participated in the event. Now, if you finished um, top in, there was another event. If you finished in the top, the skin that you got was permanent for the top. I believe top 10 got that skin. Uh, so there's a lot of skins. I mean, there's, I think in the Paramount Cup system, there is, there's going to be, as, like this one here, there's going to be five or six skins to be had in this event which is pretty big. Interesting. Yeah. It sounds like they've maybe made some tweaks to that, which I I think is good. I think that's a good start. I think if they can tweak it further, I think that would be even better, but you know, somewhere to start is, is always good. Um, so I want to, I want to transition now. And for those of you, just to kind of give you a little, uh, you know, context here, um, for those of you that have played Warpath for any, you know, real length of time, you know, something that has plagued Warpath or started to play Warpath really since about the first Paramount Cup is when it really started to become noticeable uh, is the cheating aspect of this game. I'm not saying it's never happened before the first Paramount Cup, but once the first Paramount Cup took place, there was a lot of questions in regards to a couple of the teams in the Paramount Cup uh, that there may have been some cheating taking place. Uh, There was no definitive proof at that time that cheating had taken place from any of those teams. There has been uh, some videos created that were, um, you know, pretty interesting and pretty questionable about some things that were going on at that time. But one of the big things that uh, TQ5 and the Lilith team discussed on his trip was uh, the topic of cheating in Warpath and how they are working to combat it. Um, and, and I think, and I think I speak for the whole community when I say that cheating is definitely not a good thing and that should not be a part of this game at all. Um, it's hard to combat all of it. You know, account sharing in a perfect world wouldn't be allowed either. It's pretty hard to stop that. I get it, but kind of walk us down that path on what Lilith said in regards to the cheating and what things they may be doing to help fix it. Okay. So 
uh, for everybody that, that doesn't know, I was in AVE for about four months um, before, uh, d- during the per- first Paramount Cup. I joined them uh, um, three level fours prior to the Paramount Cup. I was in them with the Paramount Cup, and then after the Paramount Cup was over, I left. I left after the Cup was over. I would have left during the Cup, um, but you can't leave once you're in a level four. You're stuck. <laughs> right. No, it's but, true. So during my time with them, I was asked to participate in these chats that they have, and uh, it was set up by the people at the top, and I participated in it, and the what they wanted, what they wanted, and here's how they went down the. And it's funny how people get sidetracked with some of this stuff, and they they want an edge, and they'll do whatever it takes to get to that edge. And so what I think happened was they started down this path. And so what happened when the computer part of the game was added? Because I, I play on an iPad, which is through Apple. Uh, but, but there was a period of time prior to that where they added computer gameplay with it as well and when they did that they opened up a can of worms that Lilith didn't realize they had opened because with a computer you can do a lot more things in a game and so what what had happened in AVE is there was about five players I'm not going to say any names but everybody knows who they are there were about five players that what they had done they set up these computers and they had logins for 15 players because that's how many people are in an AG and they would auto train units. And that's when in you, everyone saw it. There was lots of videos out there. And what they did was is they, and when you can run an, an AG that has endless supply of units, because if you can control the, the flow of units like that, it's you, the activity level is off the charts. Yeah. And so, and believe me, I, I, I don't think um, Lilith would have banned these players had that been the only thing. They were asked to stop. Uh, it didn't happen. But what they did also was they, they, used, um, they, they used Apple. And, and pe- the people that have played the games before are going to know this. Um, you can send a request to Apple and... Uh, say something that isn't true and get your money back. And they, they've clamped down on it a lot. Apple doesn't do it as much as they used to. In Game of War, there was people that did it for years. They were able to get their money back. The, you know, they, would, they would buy packs and then ask for their money back. And the game didn't realize what was going on. Well, Lilith caught up to it pretty quick. And um, because they're so conservative, they're so well thought of, and they don't want to affect the game very much. There were more. Go- there was more cheating going on than just that, but this was an example made, and it was very impactful. People noticed, and it did affect what was going on. Now, they still have their eye on the ball. They have no qualms of banning others. They said that if, if it happens again, they will chop people's feet out from under them again. Good. They will do it. They, they, they hope that the example stops it. And I believe it did. It even, believe it or not, it was so impactful that in this level, uh, this cup, level two cup or Paramount Cup two, there hasn't been any aggroing at all. <laughs> right. And, and no, that's not considered cheating. Now, we consider it cheating as game players because it's like, oh, this sucks. Sure. Because it really affects the game when you have friends aggroing like that and it makes it tough. It, sure. it basically, it basically slows the game down. Um, and it stopped that too, because um, it, people don't want to take a chance. They will, they will throw you out of the game and it, as conservative as they are, they want their game to work well and be fair. Sure. They are they are very thoughtful about that, and I really liked what they had to say about it. And they they were surprised how involved I was in it. They were like, "You they they, they had no idea that I had left because of it." And I showed them chats. You have some of these chats where uh, that I sent to you, where you can see the conversations where they were going. Um, there's many more. I, I, I didn't think to get too deep in the weeds with it because to me it's in the past and it has fixed the game and the game is played very well now without that. And 
there there were a lot of people that uh, that didn't know of it in the game. They had no clue. And when I left, they didn't believe me because sure. there was nothing said in open chat. It was in these private groups. Sure. And so they didn't understand. And then when it happened, I got a lot of people, believe it or not, I got a lot of people saying, oh, dude, we, we understand why now. And, you know, I, I still chat with them every day. A lot of those players still ask questions of me. Hey, what are you doing here with these new officers? And I tell them and, and they're, they, they're still playing on, on that side. And they, they really uh, appreciated the, uh, the input that I gave them because, you know, even after it was over, they asked, Hey, what, so this was all true. I'm like, yeah, it, it was, it, it, it happened. You saw the proof of it when these players are no longer in the game. Sure. And uh, now they, they, they could come back and start over. I have Lilith said that they have no qualms of them starting over, but those accounts that they had are gone. Sure. They, they were deleted. And now for those of you watching this, what he's talking about when he's talking about or referencing the, um, you know, kind of first round of an example that Lilith actually made. So AVE was at one time, um, on paper in the top two strongest teams in the game. And I think at that time too, their activity really reflected that power. But the issue is, is the activity was so unbelievably high and there was some, you know, videos that were done by other creators that weren't necessarily maybe definitive proof, but it was, it was pretty damn close to as definitive as you could get. Mm -hmm. Um, the first round of bands that has taken place and I covered it, in a video I did maybe a month, month and a half ago ish, there was four or five, uh, and I'm not going to name any names here because they've already been banned. They've already been punished. Uh, they are not at least on those particular accounts anymore. They are no longer in the game. Uh, but there were five of some of the top players, not only in AVE, but also in the game in general uh, that have been banned. And I think that says a lot that speaks volumes to me as a player. Uh, and I'm obviously not anywhere near on the same level of, you know, power or spending as like TQ5, for example. Uh, but I do invest money, probably more than I want to want to think about. Uh, but I, uh, I do, and I know a lot of other players do, and I fall into the bigger group of players uh, that are, you know, small to medium-sized spenders, not, you know, very, very large spenders. But even us small to medium-sized spenders, uh, you know, we want our money to bring us value and when we are competing against players that are not only spending an insane amount of money, but now they're cheating when they play on top of that, it really kind of takes away the fun and enjoyment aspect of the game, which at the end of the day, it's a game and that's what we're all here for, whether it's just for pure fun, whether it's for an escape from real life, whatever it is, we want to be able to enjoy it and have the community aspect to it. Yeah. But that's what he's referring to just for context. There was five really large, four or five really large players in AVE specifically. And those players happen to also be some of the bigger players in the game in general that have been banned from the game uh, and from those accounts permanently. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that in regards Not to your to trip? Not to that. I think, okay. I think that's pretty well covered ground. I mean, okay. it, it, uh, it has been, and it's amazing. It has fixed it completely. And uh, I was thankful for what Lilith well, the conversation we had because they didn't want to specifically name names. And you got to understand from their point, they, they don't want to look like they were the bad guys, but they had to do something because it was, there was, they said it was the most outpouring uh, call for help that they had gotten from the community again. Cause yeah. it, it, it was an amazing how many people sent videos and, and, and said, Hey, this, there's something wrong here. Right. And it, it, it just made, it made the game not fun. Even, even being on that team, it was like, there's no way there's that many players online. Right. Yeah. So and then I mean, when you talk, and what was funny is, is I knew it wasn't in cause in the chat, you'd look in the Alliance chat and there's no chat. It, it was that way for 30 minutes. There'd be right. no chat. No one's talking. You could ask a question and no one would answer. It, so it, it, there wasn't that many people on. So it was, it was pretty clear. And yeah. There were some people that stuck their heads in the sand and sure, and always they're didn't always believe it. it. Yeah, and it uh, it it they they know now what right. happened was real. Yeah, I mean, hopefully they do. Uh, you know, there's there's some people I've I've learned um, that you know 
certain some people have their own truth so it doesn't matter what you put in front of them they're still not going to believe it if they don't want to but hopefully that has brought uh you know a whole new level of understanding and of you know proof to some of these players uh and and i agree you know to touch on your point real quick about them not wanting to be the bad guy uh i think i think everybody would have viewed them as the bad guys if they didn't take action but i know myself and thousands of other players are extremely thankful for them being willing to uh you know ban these players because some of these players like like we said are some of the bigger players in the game and that's a lot of you know revenue that they are losing by removing those players but i think that goes to show how much they care about the game and they also value the community and the gameplay uh experience that we have um as a community now transitioning off of that topic uh about cheating Let's talk about, and you mentioned this to me before we actually started recording here, another topic that you guys discussed why you were at the Lilith headquarters was Navy. So let's kind of run me through that. Okay, so they asked some questions about it because they want to know what what they thought. And my answer to them was, I told them, and they they looked at me funny, I, I told them, I said, when modern units came out, I didn't think it was good. But then I fell in love with the modern units and was like, I, I love it. I love what they did. And I said, so don't be afraid to try it. I put it out there. Let's see how it goes because they are going to try it in the future. I don't know when they didn't, you know, that's a tightly guarded secret when they're going to do it, but they have it all set up. They're going to do it. Um, They, uh, and one of the other things we talked about that might be interested and I started doing it now, I was a little hesitant to do it when it came out. It just didn't seem right. And I've struggled with it for the past, week but i think i've got it ironed out now um i don't know if you've tried it but the pluto mall thing they were very interested in getting that rolling well and uh they asked me to try it and i said i want to try it will you help me set it up and we were going to set it up there but um i told him i wanted to wait because once you set it up in the money that you set it up in it's going to stay in that money so when i was over there it had me set up in the singaporean dollar because of the region I was in and my iPad. So I told him I'd wait to do it when I got home. I got home, I set it up in US dollars because that's where I live. And I've been doing it and it makes it so much more fluid because when you buy packs on uh, an ISO device, it takes time. It has to approve each purchase and go through the process and then boom, you finally get it. So it it takes a a few seconds each time you make a purchase. And when you're making multiple purchases you can spend a half hour buying things well with the pluto mall when you get the when whale, you get the whale pur- problems <laughs> whale <Yeah>. problem <laughs> can't you relate can buy, can't relate believe it or not you can buy a thousand dollars worth of diamonds at a time in pluto mall and then when you go back in game the diamonds are there and now when you click on to buy things it's instant it happens really fast so you can roll through and buy everything you want to buy in just a minute or two. So it's fast. So that's been a really neat feature. Plus they give 5% and they've talked about bumping that up to 10% to get more of the masses to try it. Sure. Because it does work. It's, it's the same as the ISO payment. It's just through them instead of through Apple. Right. And for those yeah. of you, just a quick kind of side note, I did this, um, I can't, I don't recall exactly. It was either the very beginning of 2024 or towards the end of 2023, but I've actually made a video dedicated to the um, Pluto Mall shop. So if you guys don't know what he's talking about, or if you guys want to see how that actually operates, I've got a video for that just as kind of reference for you guys, if you are interested in checking that out and you don't know how it already operates. Yeah. And, and I think they're on the edge. If, if a lot of people said, Hey, I want to do it, but um, bump it up to 10%. They talked about that when I was there and man, imagine getting a 10, that's like every, so for every, um, hundred dollars you bought, you'd get $10 worth of, uh, you'd get a $10 pack for free. Right. It, no, that's it fantastic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. hundred yeah, percent. So they're on the edge. All, all they need is the community to say, Hey, bump that up to 10. And I think they're going to do it. They felt comfortable in doing it that way. So, it, it just it's just a matter of enough of us asking and they might do it. They're pretty friendly about that kind of thing and they might do it. Uh, but, you know, I was surprised for them to tell me that Apple charges 30 percent when you buy it through Apple. 
So they're only get for every um, ten bucks, they're only getting seven of it. Sure. So through Pluto Mall, they get it all. Right. So they have a little bit more to share. So it, I think if the request came in from enough people, they would probably do it. It would. I think it would. Uh, and then and then it would it would be a win win. I think because it's a win for the players because you're getting a ten percent boost. Right now it's only five. But imagine if it was 10. I mean, that's a lot. I mean, I think over, I, I don't even want to venture a guess of how much I've spent in this game. I, I, I have a ballpark. It's a, no, it's, a, it's a number most people would choke on. We might, but, we might have to talk about that at the end. <laughs> in, a, in another video? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, but it, uh, it, it could, it's a, I bet I could buy a house with a 10% savings. <laughs> well, I, I don't doubt it. You know, and that's the thing, right? Like the, the Pluto Mall is, is a very legitimate thing. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're mentioning that and, and kind of throwing that idea out there. Um, so for those of you watching, you know, I think maybe wink, wink, nod, nod. Um, you know, Tiki Fives may be saying, hey, maybe we should as a community start throwing this 10%, uh, you know, suggestion out there and seeing if it's something that they would be interested in implementing. But I think at the end of the day, right, it's, to me, it's it's a win, and that's why I went in and made a video on it, and I actually kind of put my boots on the ground, so to speak, on this to make sure it was legitimate, and it is 100% legitimate. You're getting the same amount of value, actually more, for more. your money, and it's a win-win for both parties, right? Because now yeah. Lilith is getting the full amount of the transaction, and then you're getting free additional value just by making the same transaction for the same purchase price that you would through your device, whatever that may be. Yeah. Yeah, so. it, it's it, it, it. I haven't seen that video. I didn't know you had that one. But when I was watching these videos early on, that the, the videos have very good uh, value to them. The the one video that sticks in my head, and you're probably not going to remember. It's way back um, at the beginning. Um, you put out a video of what's the best thing to do with with the gold that you gather, and I I remember it well. It was it was VIP you get the most bang for your buck putting your gold in VIP. And I took that to heart. I meant I, my VA, I, I, every drop of the gold I got for the first year to two years went in VIP. And when I got maxed VIP, it, it made a huge difference with those buffs, you know, cause yeah. in this game, people don't realize how important buffs are. 100%. Buffs give you advantage. Yep. And because otherwise if, if, if all being equal, buffs are where you separate the, the top players from the, the medium players and the medium players from the small players. It all comes down to buffs. And buffs can be gotten in a bunch of ways. Sure. Um, they can be gotten in scientific research, uh, building upgrades. VIP is the biggest one, I think. And yep. now we have these skin sets and chat bubbles and, and things that get you higher in that category. And that's... Those buffs are huge. They add big advantages to how the game is played when you get those things. Sure, sure. Um, no, I think that's all very accurate and very, uh, very informative stuff. I want to, uh, before we branch off and head uh, in a different direction here, I want to talk about the Navy just for a couple more minutes here. So I made a, Lilith put out a roadmap for pretty much the remaining uh, time through 2024. They did it towards the beginning of the year, I believe in February, late January, early February. I made a video on it. And on that roadmap that they had released, they didn't specify exactly when they just said in Q4 of 2024. So towards the end of the year, uh, they were going to implement Navy. When you were there visiting with them and talking about Navy, and if you can't share this, uh, obviously uh, don't don't feel obligated to share it, but did they happen to discuss, is the Navy going to be something that's like level four specific, or is it going to be something that's just incorporated full-time in the whole game? What they said was it's going to, it's going to be an entirely different um, level four. Okay. Because the map's got to be different. It's got to have more water. Sure. And and more objectivity to it. So they are they are they are considering making it because right now, um, you know, there's only one level four. So they're considering having a completely separate level four, kind of like the Paramount Cup is separate from level four. Um, they're they're considering having that as an area where teams can go and play it at the beginning. That's what they said is. 
is they're they're gonna they're, it, they they want it to work, and I think it's going to. I think it's going to be like the modern unit upgrade. I think it's going to be a. I think it's going to be an entirely different unit setup. You're going to have to start from scratch and build these units, and it's going to take time, which is good because then it's going to give an area for the new players a chance to start building where the where they don't have to play so much catch up with the current the, the current units. So someone might join the game tomorrow and when the navy comes out they start pouring all their their resources and 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 uh, coupons into navy. I think that's the way they're going to do it. That's the way it seemed when they were talking about it. And uh, then they'll be able to have a stronger navy than they do ground unit. But overall, it, it, it's I think it's going to be a, a whole different characteristic of the game. Um, you know, because one of the big things it, right now is for there's a lot of players out there that um, that are done with research, done with builds, and they. Like it, for me in Battle Honors, one of the things that I haven't gotten done with yet is all the officers. I still have officers that aren't awakened. Um, and the best way to get statues is Battle Honors. I struggle in Battle Honors now uh, winning that event because there are the days that I can't even participate. Uh, when you do the, the building upgrades, I have no buildings to upgrade. When you have the research day, I have no research to do. So it's it's a struggle, and it uh, it's one of those things where you have to play the game. You have to find the area that allows you to play where you can, you know, compete still in that area. Um, now, for the people that are in the region I'm in, I'm sure that they would bitch and say, "This fucker keeps winning, and I never get a chance." But but I do lose. I lose quite a bit lately. I still lose in arena, believe it or not. There are guys that have tattooed down how to play arena, and I still get beat. Now my officers help with that area, and I can still finish up in the top three pretty easily. But there are guys that still beat me in those areas. But sure. it, it's because I'm handicapped. In Battle Honors, I'm handicapped. There are, I think there's at least three days there that I struggle to to get, uh, that I end up with zeros in points because there's nothing to do. I think that's another one of those uh, whale problems right there. That's uh, yeah, the, us common folks cannot uh, cannot relate to that whatsoever. But you actually, to be fair though, you make a really good point, and that's actually honestly something that I've genuinely never thought of. Is you know you're one of the stronger players in the game. You've pretty much maxed everything, but I haven't ever really thought about that dynamic, and that's very interesting. So I appreciate you bringing that perspective up to me uh, about. You know, while it's a different kind of struggle, it still is a struggle for even players at the top on how to get some of these items, uh, like statues, like officer statues, like you had mentioned. And I think that is, in a way, almost kind of a good thing, maybe, as weird as that probably sounds, because that's once big players like yourself are, you know, done with everything, at least everything that's currently available in the game it gives all of the other players that are small to medium spenders a chance to maybe get, get some of those rewards and get, to get caught up just a little bit. Um, but no, that's a, that's definitely an interesting perspective. Now um, I want to kind of branch off here and in a way kind of double back to what we've already talked about, but get some additional thoughts from you on ways that they might be able to, in addition that, to the things we've already talked about ways in your opinion that they can maybe improve the game, balance the game, and just create a better overall uh, player experience. Yeah, I think adding adding more events is going to do it. I, and they they plan on adding more events. I mentioned to them in this roundtable meeting that we had, um, because what a lot of people have is when the level four is over, there's a two-week period of time where there's nothing to do. Sure. There's nothing to do in your own uh, server. And I told him, I said, you know, why not come up with an event that gives everyone on the team something to do? Um, and what I told him was I thought a monster event where each day the monsters got a bit stronger and you had individual monsters that can be killed. Kind of like, you know, in the, the Halloween one where they had the, the little ghost, mm -hmm. they had uh, the, that koi fish, things like that that give out things that little guys can't get any other way, you know, materials. 
where they can, it's something to do that, that um, the team has to participate because it, you know, team building needs those kind of events because uh, imagine if they did a 10 day event during the off period after the level four for each day, the team had uh, a certain amount of these team level or boss monsters to kill where they had to do it in AGs or multiple AGs to kill these monsters. But then everyone in the group that, that kills it gets pri a prize or some materials, um, something that a value that people need to upgrade their units and officers and things like that. It would give everyone something to do during the off time that wouldn't be so boring and wouldn't cause the teams to say, hey, there's nothing to do. I'm just taking that time off. Because that's what happens in the off time is people just say, I'll see you in a, I'll see you in a week. They'll just take the whole week off and they're sure. gone. Game. Sure, sure, sure. No, I think I think uh, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think that's definitely some food for thought there. Um, let me ask you this: kind of in addition to, or kind of going off. This has nothing really to do with like the balancing of the game, but just um, you know, I made a suggestion on the official Warpath Discord server the other day that I kind of just threw out there. It's more for like nostalgia purposes um, for us veteran players, but I think it would be fun for. Uh, you know, the whole player base. Um, so I just want to kind of get your thought on on something along these lines. I threw out an idea to keep kind of the game fresh and exciting in addition to adding new conquest maps and adding new dynamics like the Navy, for example, doing something like a throwback theater of conquest where everybody uh, at every level was could only use classic units up to 7.2. You still had all of your tech that was... Uh, you know, able to be applied. So like even your modern war tech that was still applied just to the classic units. Uh, obviously they would have to do some kind of, of scaling back and balancing of like the fortified walls because obviously 7.2 units don't do nearly the amount of damage. Uh, so maybe they could revert uh, all base walls and stuff like that uh, back to just a standard level 32, but then keep all of your base tech wherever it's at. I don't know. What are your thoughts on doing something like maybe a throwback event? There are so many things that I think they could do and try. And to me, the, 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 the success is going to come from trying different things. Sure. It's not always going to win, just like that turret thing that they did. Sure. It, did, it didn't win because it, it stalled the game. Um, when, it, when you got a turret built and the bubbles were in, it stalled the game. It's like a rain day in San Francisco. No one played during that time. But if you don't try it, you don't know if it's going to work. And so right. I think they should... They should have events that are that are based in trial that say, hey, we're going to try this event and see how it works. Right. And I think it's worth doing it. That way, when they find something that works, it's going to be a win-win for the community and a win for them. Because if it works, people are going to spend money to play it. If, if it uh, works, uh, Lilith is going to get that money. If it works, we're going to have things to do that keep the game interesting and fun and challenging. So I agree. I think I think they should try a lot of things. I think the Navy thing is going to be a big hit. I think people are going to love it um, because it, it, it will be a new part of the game that will imagine having a, a destroyer that could shoot rockets inland and and hit bases. There's going to be a whole new dynamic that comes from that. Yeah, that uh, that that will uh, that will add flavor to the game because there there are little things in the game now that that people are like, I didn't know you could do that. Like, for instance, if you have someone offline, uh, because of the way the game works, you could take a, uh, a unit and charge it and, uh, with Ravens and fire one time and go back in your base and hit the, hit the other base with it. And I call it spamming because I've seen it done. You can kill a big base. If they're not online, it, it may take an hour maybe an hour and a half, but you can kill a big base with that one hit because it is a, um, uh, an officer skilled hit because you charge that unit up. And that's what people do now. They charge it before units come in, but imagine doing that to an offline base. People don't realize that there's a lot of things that you can do in this game because people aren't on all the time. Sure. And, uh, and there's little tricks that, uh, that can make small players strong um, I haven't seen anyone do it yet, but in this game, because everyone plays, uh, the, for the most part, the masses play offense. Um, I chose to play defense, and people 
thought it was crazy for a whale to play defense. I actually like it. I like seeing what little tweaks I can do to make the defensive position stronger. And I don't mind testing it. And I, there's been videos made of strong defenses. I sent you a report that happened in this event that was the best report I've ever gotten in a top-level event. It was almost 11K kills against AVE with, I think it was 95 units. And it lasted four minutes. It, I wished I could have gotten it on video because it was, it was incredible. Because they all went away. It, it, they all just, the entire... And they had to get rid of me because I was blocking a build that they wanted and they couldn't kill me. And it, I was like, I finally got the mix just right at that moment. And it, it was pretty, it was pretty impressive. I didn't have it on video. Otherwise you'd have it by now, but it, it was pretty cool. Um, but those things can be done with little guys. So one of the things that uh, previous games have taught me is that uh, cleverness in a game will get you far. And so you can, you can build a, like for, for instance, I think an interesting built setup for a, a small player would be all light tanks. Imagine if you had five light tanks, you can attach aircraft to those light tanks and fighters, and you could build three fighters. So you could have those three fighters attached to five light tanks and they would all travel together. That would be, especially if it was a, a strong setup with strong parts, it'd be tough. I, I think a helicopter AG would get eaten uh, really easily with that. And you don't have to be a big player to do that. It, it could be a pretty small player set that up and, and make success. But I would call that all offense. Right. That would be a solid offense setup where sure. everything went to offense. Now, you can do all defense, too. I think there is a, a validity now, especially with these officers that hit multiple targets, where you could be a small player that someone thinks, oh, I can go hit him. He's only 350 mil. Uh, I, I can send just my units after him and send the ar artillery. But with red heat, there's other officers that hit multiple targets. If you if you kill those already, you're going to kill their whole unit, all six, 700 units are going to go away before they're able to tank the base, so to speak. And it, it's, it's a pretty clever way of doing it. I've been, I've been seeing some of that lately, especially with these new officers like red heat that, uh, that cause significant damage to multiple units in a group. And it, it works. You, you'll, you can see, uh, uh, there I've seen it. There's been several three, 350 mil players, kill an entire um, uh, group of ar artillery that the that red heat starts killing the artillery and if it targets just right it can kill the entire ag yeah no i think i think you're uh, i think you're spot on with that that's uh, that's all good advice and i and i i 100% uh, for whatever my opinion's worth uh, agree with that i think that's something that i see a lot of uh, you know free to play uh, especially in small spenders do incorrectly and then they you know start to i guess face the the consequences of their decisions as we all do whether that's positive or negative but what i've seen a lot of players do is they will spread their development around right so they'll do a little bit of tank tech a little bit already tech mm -hmm. a little bit of this a little bit of that but if you go all in on some on just like one thing like you were saying yeah uh you one know all offense all defense whatever um you know whether you want to be in uh, an already specific player, whether that be offensive or defensive, because there's plenty of players that play with artillery in the open field in an offensive kind of mindset. And then, yeah. you know, if you wanted to go all in on tanks for an offensive setup, you know, I think that, um, you know, I think that's going to be able to keep those free to play and smaller spenders, uh, you know, relevant and competitive in the game and keep them um, enjoying the, the game and the fun aspect of that. So that leads me to my next question. Uh, if you were to suggest two players for new uh, two units, I'm sorry. If you were to suggest two units for new players coming into the game, whether they were free free to play or huge spenders, what two units uh, or unit types rather would you suggest they make? I think the light tank and the fighter combination is the best because you can you can attach them to each other and they will move as one 
uh, in a group. And it's the only way you can do that. You can't, fighters won't attach to artillery. Believe me, if they did, it would make it tough to kill that artillery group. If you could attach fighters to artillery like you, like you can to light tanks, you can put them in a squad. And in that squad, small players have an advantage. You don't have to worry about the, with a, with a light tank. Uh, imagine, and I used to do this all the time and people hated it. Imagine a light tank in behind in the reserves and typically what happens to a light tank that's by itself is someone sends a, a MARTA bomber and kills that light tank because it's by itself. But if you attach the fighter, it, say you've got only two units that you focused on, those two units together offer a pretty substantial defense. Now, you are going to get killed if you let a helicopter unit or another light tank AG catch up with you. Um, you will be you will be eliminated, but you're you're playing a stealth position. You're you're not you're not trying to fight big AGs. You're trying to get to the reserves, slip into the back lines, and make a difference in the reserve setting. Um, so it, it's not a, a stand your ground setup. It's a it's a move fast and and hit and move type thing and for small spenders and no spenders it's the easiest place to get set up sure no i think i think that's um uh, i think that's good advice and i you know we kind of already touched on it but i'm just going to ask it i guess almost in a way again just to give uh you know new players especially kind of a clear direction do you think it's better when players are you know, going about developing their units, building their units, especially in the early stages of the game where they still got just classic units. Do you think it's better for players to create more of a niche setup, like we were talking about? Uh, you know, all tanks, uh, primarily artillery in a defensive or an offensive role there, or do you think it's better to have more of a balanced, like quote unquote, hybrid setup? I, I think I think the niche setup is the is the is the easier way to play in this game because especially if you coordinate it with an alliance. Because uh, one of the things that people don't look at in the game is if you put all of your offensive players in the front and you've got your defensive players in the back and they're providing units forward, it, it, it's tough to beat that. And that, that's more of a niche setup. And little players can get involved in that, and it, it makes it fun for everyone when that can go that way. Sure. Um, and, uh, and one of the big things I think m most little players overlook is parts. Um, people don't realize uh, – I asked this question to Lilith when I was at the headquarters because I was curious about it. Um, parts, they, they, they're random. They're, there's – no rhyme or reason to what part comes up. So if you go back in and don't look at the power of the part, that is, that is a false sense of where that part is. You need to look in the upper right corner of firepower of the part, the actual what the part does up in that upper right corner. There's a range of how it's set up. And that range is how you determine whether or not the part is really good or mediocre. If it's at the lower end of that, it's it's not worth having. You want the very top part. Um, so don't be afraid to recycle it and start over. Now, I will admit that uh, it's hard to get those blueprints. Those blueprints are tough. For sure. But you got to keep at it. You got to keep recycling and get it. And I have started, and it's it kills me. It drives me crazy to break a gold plus plus part. <laughs> Yeah, we, but, uh, most of us players don't have that problem. Uh, but if you want the top part, um, you, like I, my setup now, I have three artillery, the light tank, and an infantry for tanking. And it's, it's the MARTA infantry. It's set up for defense because I want it to last as long as possible while my artillery is hitting a base. And I use the light tank as a stinger in there because it's completely maxed. It's got all the top parts. I've, I actually have enough to build three light tanks. I've never had three light tanks out, but I, I have enough parts to do it because I keep recycling those parts as I get better parts. When I get a blueprint, I make it. And I do not miss those two events. You've got the slot machine event and the 
mutant event where you can get parts of the ground units, parts of the air units, and don't miss it. As a small player, you do not want to miss out on getting that done because that's a very hard thing to come by as those blueprints. And it's random. You you could you could I've done it on the light tank. I bet each one of those parts, I've remade those parts, I bet 10 times each. And it takes a lot to get those top parts. And you want those parts very near the very top range up in the upper right of that part. And you can compare what where you're at on it by going to the part, seeing what the number is, and then going down to create to see the part before you've built it and it'll show you the total range that's important right because you want to know where the top range of that is because when you make that part if it's not very near or at that range it's not perfect and you want to make that part the very top best it can be because in a light tank if you have every part the very top you can get and then the the sub supply parts at the bottom are all firepower that rope and they're the best, your firepower on a light tank is very, very strong. And it can do a lot of damage, as most people have seen when they come up against me. They're like, oh, we're going to eat that light tank up. And then all of a sudden they wonder how three helicopter units were completely destroyed by my light tank. They, they lost all their units, and I may have lost 12 light tanks in that battle, three to one. And they wonder, how is that possible? It's parts. You got to have the parts have to be perfect and uh, you have to keep at it. You have to consistently keep, you know, breaking parts and remaking parts, build them again sure. until you get them right. And the little guys don't realize it. You know, uh, a gold part is very strong. If you look at it compared to a gold plus, it's not as strong, but that's the very top level. But even a, a perfect gold plus part is super strong and it's important to get that part rebuilt. And if it's not right, you get it all back in a, in a gold plus or lower part, you're going to get everything back except for the blueprint. And so it's, it's worth, uh, it's worth recycling and keep it going because the materials, uh, as you get further along materials and wrenches are the hardest thing to come by in the game. They're the thing you need the most of. Sure. 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 So with that being said, what is your personal favorite unit in the game? Like unit type, are you a light tank, main battle tank, fighter, plane, yeah. artillery? What's your favorite, favorite unit? Yeah, it's, it's the light tank. I really do like the light tank. Yeah. Um, there's a lot, I, I started out liking the, the Liberty bomber, but it, uh, in the, when you get to this level, if it's not completely maxed out, it's not doing much base damage. Now it'll do some unit damage, but you know, it doesn't move around like uh, like a Marta bomber does, so you don't get the target a unit and it stay on it. So it 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 kind of fell off as one of my favorite parts at the top level. Now, in gold, it probably still crushing un uh, bases when they're not uh, walled up, where they're not all their walls aren't two hundred or three hundred, whatever it is. Now, I don't I don't know. It's it's been so long since I built a wall. I don't know right. what they are. That's fair. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I, it's always been the light tank. I have been a light tank fan from way back because of what it does. Even uh, I wasn't uh, even close to being a big player and my light tank made major damage to big, to big alliances. That's how I got noticed by Av. They didn't know I was even in 30. Um, but I, they, I, somehow or another, I got into a fight with them. Um, and my light tank was eating them up. Um, early on and they, they noticed, they were like, Hey, how have you not been in our group? And I'm like, well, I've been down here playing in silver and gold one. And they go, well, you need to come play with us. And that's how I ended up there. But it, uh, it, it, the light tank is by far the easiest unit to, to get to a level where you can actually have some fun with it. Sure. No, I agree with that. Actually. I, uh, I finally made the transition to, uh, the light tank, gosh towards the end of of 2023 and it has you know the it kind of got i really didn't have a clear direction on what i wanted to do like in terms of investing in technology you know because as you start to get into the you know modern war aspect of technology you kind of have to really niche down into a specific unit type and I, I didn't really know what i wanted to do 
um, cause I just played the game for so long and I'm like, ah, you know, I'm, eh. and then I started, you know, finally playing with the light tank and it kind of revitalized my interest in tanks. And I started really enjoying the game again on a, you know, a really, uh, big level. And so I agree. I think the light tank is my favorite unit too, for sure. Um, so a couple of more things to, um, you know, kind of wind this down here. Do you see yourself playing Warpath or continuing to play Warpath for the foreseeable future? I do. I do. I, I'm still loving playing the game. It's still a lot of fun. I, uh, I, you know, I, I, every aspect of it is very, very fun to play. I, I, I even, I, I, I like the chat too. The chat's kind of interesting because obviously world chat or theater chat, sometimes it can get south and oh, the yeah. best thing to do hurry. is just not be on it. Right. You, you end up with meatball. I call them meatballs because it's a friendly thing to call them, but it's just like, what are you doing? Is it always got to go this way? But, uh, but yeah, I mean, Alliance chat is fun because you get players in your Alliance that, that want to ask questions and are not sure about it. And so I'm one of the players that, you know, hit me up in discord. If you want to see pictures really easily or, or uh, get me in the chat where I can show you things that, that sometimes I'm not really even thinking about and they young players don't know. And, and so there's, I've, I answer stuff from people I've never even met before that are in alliances that are like, I, I had a question the other day from a guy that plays in, I'm pretty sure it's server 46 or 47 asked me a question and I answered it for him and he goes, man, you're the first person that's ever answered back. And it's cause I'm, I, I will answer any question from anybody. If they, if they want, just ask, I I'm, I'm open to ask and answer a question. Now I have my own way of doing it. So it, it's a weird way. A lot of times people are like, what in the hell is he doing? Right. But it's, it's my way. Cause I like to look at things differently. I don't want, I've never built a helicopter. I refuse to build helicopters. I didn't like them. Um, I've, I've got everything. I've got every helicopter built. I've got all the helicopter skins and I could build them, but I just never got into it. But the nice thing about what Lilith has done, if I want to play helicopters this afternoon, I could reset and rebuild three helicopters and play three helicopters tomorrow. Sure. Or, or this afternoon. It's, it's fast. That's what's nice about the game. You don't have to be stuck in one way of playing uh, the game. Lilith has made it to where for 20 gold, uh, you, could, you could reset a unit. You get all of that stuff back and you could reset a new unit. And I do it quite regular. Sure. Um, so I like the Marta bomber in concert with the light tank because there are sometimes you're chasing another light tank and it's escaping. If you're trying to kill one that's back in the back, killing reserves, you could, I could run my light tank after it. It's running and my Marta bomber come in and freeze it. And sure. boom, yep. I got it. Yeah. It's over. So I switch from that to the Liberty bomber a lot because and it, it doesn't take long. You know, they've made the the fix to that. You can swap between those in very short order. I'd say in two minutes, I could go from one bomber to the next or one unit to the next because of the you can reset it. And then there's a rapid build where as long as you've got the stuff, you could build the next one back to, to 9.2 and have it fully maxed instantly. It's pretty fast. I like it. I like that feature. It's a fun feature to do. And I have a feeling when they come with the Navy, that's going to be what happens. The big players are going to instantly have a full Navy ready to go to test out. And you know all the big players are going to say, okay, let's see what happens when you build a Navy. And right. Because I, I could build all eight units maxed now. It, all of them can go max if I wanted. So you could switch that. And imagine when they come out with Navy, there are going to be a lot of players that have three units, two units, four units. They're going to switch it and try it and see how it goes. So it, it's, I look forward to it. I think the Navy is going to be an, uh, a new level four that's going to be exciting to play. I, I really do. I look forward to it. Yeah, no, totally agreed with that. Um, last question I have got here is, do you have any advice for players just across Warpath in general? Not, not even just specifically talking about units or tech. Do you just have any advice that you'd like to, to throw out there for players? Yeah, don't don't spend your life savings. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a good point. It's a great great piece of advice. It's easy to do. 
Um, but the, uh, I, I think the best question uh, that if people, where do you do the most to get the most bang? It goes back to that video you made two or three years ago. Uh, VIP, put, put your, put your money in VIP. It is the single best buff you're going to get for your money. And it, it will get you the most far in the game. Cause once you, once you get up there to those upper levels, there's so many things that people don't even realize that VIP give you that is huge. It's really huge. And that, that would probably be my biggest advice for, for the players that aren't already got it at 25 is to is to put your money in VIP. That's the best place to go with it. I mean, a lot of people put it in units, but I would rather have one really good unit with a high VIP than four okay units, maybe not all max, but all up there big and no VIP to go with it. Sure. VIP sure. is more important, I think, than than better units. Sure. No, I think that's great. Uh Great advice there. Well, I really appreciate your time. You taking the time to come on and talk. Uh, when you reached out to me, let me know about the uh, trip you were taking to Lilith. I was pretty excited to hear how that went and have the chance to connect after that. Uh, so like I said, I genuinely appreciate you coming on, taking your time. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, so taking time out of your day to come on, uh, chat, and then also give some advice and guidance to uh, the community. So truly, I appreciate it. Yeah, and you can reach out anytime you want. I'm I'm available a lot. I've been retired a long time, and I've got lots. I got nothing but time on my hands these days. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, just again for all of you guys that are watching, um, he his in game name is TQ Five. Is it TQ Five or just TQ Five Fun? Yeah, I think. Remember when they changed it recently? It was TQ Five Fun, and now it, I, it's TQ Five with a dot after it. If you look in the game, at that that's the way it comes up. Okay. Um, okay. For Discord, for Discord, I, and the end game, it's TQ Five Fun is the name of my base. Okay, gotcha. But I, I, I think I think they shortened it up. I, I golly, I'm gonna have to look at that now because I, I believe you're right. I believe it's just TQ Five. Okay, cool. Well, so with yeah. that being said, if you guys are interested in chatting with him, um, you know, and have questions, he's a great resource. Uh, so feel free. Again, he is in server 34 uh, in 34. the NFG Alliance. So if you guys are interested in finding him in game, um, or even if you just want to shoot him a quick message in game to then transition that conversation to Discord, if he uh, is open to doing that, that is where you can find him. Um, so with that being said, we're going to wind it down again. Thank you so much for your time, for your insight. Um, I'm excited to get this video out there for all of you that are watching it. And I'm, I'm really excited to see where the future of the game continues to move. Yep. So thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, guys. We will see you guys on the next video.